It's rare. It's rare. No, I'm kidding. But he does, and it's really cool. And uh, this morning, when, when we got rolling with worship this morning, um, it's always my intention to, to seek the Lord on where the enemy is attacking. It's part of my job. I'm, I'm a shepherd. And if you think about what a shepherd does, he, do, he does two things, basically. He leads the sheep to safe pasture where there's good food. You know, a good shepherd's not going to lead a sheep into a field full of thistles. That's not good to chew one. He's going to show them where Timothy and the alfalfa is, right? I guess maybe sheep like that. I don't know. That's, that's part of my job. But the other thing is um, the shepherd watches out for um, attack. He watches out for bears or wolves or whatever. That's part of his job is to... Hey, sheep, look out. There's, there's a wolf. There's a bear. I don't, I'm not going to take my kids to a dangerous place, right? That's just not what I do. I remember one time we were at, at, at uh, the place down in Halifax, Tobias, and the, there was a little lion in the cage. And my one of my girls came over and was walking around the, the fence, and the stinking lion in that fence was like this, doing one of these things. Never took its eyes off my daughter, and I was like, where's my gun? Because, you know, like that kind of attention from a predator to my child is, a, is something my hackers go up, man. I want to blow its head off. I don't even care if it wants to eat my kid or not. Maybe it thinks it's a play toy. I don't care. I want its head off. I want it in pieces. I want that threat dismantled. I want it to completely destroyed. And that's the heart of the father for the attack of Satan on you this morning. And I heard very, very clearly, and it's part of my favorite scripture, that condemnation is, is coming upon the church. And it's not from God. Conviction is, and actually we're going to talk about that this morning, and it's no secret that the Holy Spirit led me into that, but condemnation is not from God. Conviction is. There's a place where God says, hey, I need to talk to you about something. You need to deal with this. And you're like, okay, let's do that. But the attack of condemnation and fear and guilt and shame is not from the Father. It's a predatory attack from the enemy. It's all he knows how to do. He wants to accuse you of something. But this is true. This is absolute truth this morning, and I love it. I actually, I used to read Romans 8 daily because I needed to get it so bad. And he goes on a rant here, Paul does. And he says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Yeah. Amen. I'm pretty sure that when he said, therefore now there is no condemnation, he actually meant there is no condemnation. None. Zero. Think about this for a minute with me. There was no fear, there was no guilt, there was no shame, there was no anxiety, there was no worry, there was no anger, there was no malice, there was nothing of that in the garden. That was his intention from the start. Always. And it's his intention in heaven. And when he asks us to pray that we bring heaven to earth, that we that we are the vessels that carry the Spirit of God that invades, that we bring heaven to earth. There he says, pray this way, that the, the will, my will will be done on earth that's here today as it is in heaven. That means I don't carry fear, I don't carry guilt, I don't carry shame, I don't carry condemnation, I don't carry judgment. It's not mine to give. That's a pretty freeing idea. I like it. I like freedom in Jesus. It's not a sin license at all. That's not the point. It's the opposite. So I want to encourage you with that this morning. And I forgot to do the announcements, so I'm going to do the announcements now. And I started preaching. Um, maybe it's good that way the book face people can watch the announcements. Um, this is Crick. To all of you hooked on farms people, Crick. We're in the West End. We can do, we can do that. Um, men's group, and, and if you want to bring somebody that's not from this church or whatever, or full, that's great. Please do. It's, it's a very relaxed, chilled out atmosphere. And your young men. Um, I forgot to announce that recently. If your young men want to come to men's group, part of our heart is uh, turning, uh, raising kids. And I don't mean raising actually kids. I want to raise adults. If that makes sense. That's our heart. We want to turn our young people into adults. If I wanted to raise kids, I'd still have Claire on a bottle, but she's, she can eat by herself now and everything. She's even self-propelled. It's pretty cool. Um, next week at, uh, after church at Rob Schauber's house, we're going to have a meal. And I don't know what time that is. Does anybody know what time the meal is? After church. 
and it's definitely going to be after church. Um, there's a sign-up sheet out there if you want to bring something. They're going to provide a meat, I think. Is that right? Did you talk to her? Yeah, okay. they're going to provide something to eat. Bring a covered dish. Bring lawn chairs. Um, it'd be cool to just get together and hang out. We're going to be intentional over the next uh, four months of this summer to get together once a month um, on a Sunday after church. It's part of our heart. Is to, we, we want to get to know each other. And uh, that's a great way to do it. I mean, who doesn't like food? So, um, also, July 5th, we will not be meeting. There will be no church on July 5th in this building. Take the weekend off. Hang out with your family. Do what you want. Um, we're all busy on July 4th weekend, so take a break. We're taking a break. Um, other than that, am I missing anything? Good. Online giving. You, and, and if you're watching on the, on the book face we have now on our website, a uh, link to PayPal or something, you get on there and you can, and you can give online if, if that's your fancy. Yeah, this is the 20th century, or wait, no, 21st century, so I'm supposed to be like hip and plugged in and everything. Here we go. I didn't know I was going to talk this much at the beginning. That means I'll just cut some off the end, you know. The Lord says this, and in Psalm 96, he says, sing, and sing to the Lord, sing a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Pro proclaim his good tidings of salvation from day to day. And it's easy for us sometimes to follow rules. That's kind of our nature. They wanted rules from the beginning. And when the Lord actually says, I want you to do something, he actually means it. In, in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 24, it says, don't murder anybody. Um, and I got that one down. I have not murdered anybody for at least three weeks. But then I read somewhere in the scripture where it says, sing to the Lord, shout his praise, declare his goodness, praise him for his salvation. And I'm like, well, I didn't murder anybody. I'm doing okay. And the Lord's like, that's not what I desire for you. I desire worship. I want your affection. Worship has always been a place of exchange. I give him my affection for his presence. I give him my allegiance for his personhood. It's not only about receiving blessings and saying, thank you God for my family. It's about responding to the person who he is. If you think about it in the natural, when you see someone you really like, what, you're attracted to them. You give them your attention. There's an exchange made in that place. So as we go into worship this morning, I want you to grasp that, understand that. Lord, worship, the, the heart of worship really is seeing God and responding to Him. It's not rocket science, but it's yours and it's personal. So I'm going to pray, we're going to play some music, we're going to go into worship. I would encourage you to stand at your feet if you're able, and uh, let's go to worship on this morning. So Father, we welcome you in here this morning, God. We say happy Father's Day to you, perfect Father. We thank you for loving us, for caring for us, for nurturing us. And just being good. Lord, I just ask your blessing on this gathering this morning. Our worship would be pleasing to you. I pray your blessing on all our area churches this morning, God. And their pastors and their leaders. Father, it's our desire that you move in this region. That you, Jesus, are the one that's lifted up. It's not about us and it's not about what we're doing. But it is about what you want to do with us this morning. So we say good morning and have your way. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. How many believe that he's capable of bringing a Bible? Amen. Yay! Amen. Amen. Give him a shout this morning. Just tell him. Thank you, Jesus. It would be kind of silly for us to pray for revival and expect mediocrity, wouldn't it? You know, Jesus came at a time when it was not real great in, in Israel, but he brought something pretty cool. That's kind of our responsibility as the church right now bring stability, bring light and light and love. Um, there is a gathering of children over here by my sister-in-law, Kate, and if your children want to gather there, feel free. That's cool. That's what Children's Church is going to look like today. We're going to resume Children's Church back to regular, normal, whatever regular normal is, after the 5th of July, which we won't have church. It'll be the 12th, if I can do math correctly. It's the 12th on Sunday. It should be, because the 5th is. If you add 7 and 5, you get 12. At least I do. Yep, let's look at it. Where would we, where would we be without these things? There's one.
How many of you have a decision in your life that you can't find the answer to on page 76 in your Bible? <laughs> right? We got, we got stuff. There's things that we are, like, especially teenagers. My heart goes out for teenagers. Like, the enemy loves to pick, but he don't care. He's not fussy about who he picks on. But, like, teenagers are like, should I go to college? Should I not? Should I do this? Should I not? It's a tough time. It really is. And the enemy is whispering in your ear all the time saying, well, if you don't go to college, you're not going to fit in. Everybody's going to college. you got to go to college, man. you got to go to college. And I'm like, no, you don't. It's expensive. But whatever, that's not my point. My point is, there's stuff that we wrestle with. There's decisions in our lives. There's things that the Lord wants to deal with us. And and He can He can only do it through His Spirit. He can't... He, he didn't write this as a book of bondage. And where, you know, the, the epitome of freedom in Christ is relying on His Spirit to guide you. I can't find it on... on Page 76 in my Bible where it says, Dan, I want you to do this tomorrow. Or go minister to this person or do that. It's his spirit that does it. You want to put the scripture up to John. It's, I think it's John 16, 8. Let's get spiritual. Um, and, and this takes the pressure off. And I know a lot of you guys probably hear me say this a lot. But this is the Holy Spirit's job description. Okay? Whenever God, I don't know how this all worked because I don't know everything. Whenever God put this all together, he, the Holy Spirit, this is, is like his job assignment. He, when he, the Holy Spirit, personifies the Holy Spirit. It's not an it or a thing. It's a he. It's a person. Jesus, this is the words of Jesus. He says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so what's that saying? It's his job to convict. It's not mine. Good, because I can't do it. I can't convict my wife of when she's being a train wreck. I can't. I can say straighten up and I'll do all this thing. But it's the Spirit of God that brings that brings a, a point where like I'm this is a sin. The, the Spirit says, This is a sin. He might do it through another person, but he's still it's his job. It's 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 his job to say, Hey, listen, you're out of line. It's his job to convict you concerning righteousness. That's a whole other bag of wax. That's a different teaching for a different day. But righteousness is simply achieved by faith. We know that from the scriptures. And then, of course, judgment. It's his job to convict concerning judgment. It's not my job. There's another one off the list. I don't have to do that. It's not my job to judge. So, the scripture is very clear. Let's pop up Romans 14. This, this, this uh, chapter 14 of Romans deals with convictions. That's pretty much the whole job of the, of, of the idea of Romans 14. I call it the conviction chapter. He says, the faith that you have has your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. There's one more after that. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is from sin. Now, your question is, what are, whoa, 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 how do we get into food all of a sudden? Paul's using food as an example here of, listen, if my brother's convicted that he shouldn't eat meat, that's his conviction. Personally, I, I, I encourage all of you to be vegetarians because that makes more meat available for me. My belly. I like steak. I like juicy steak. And my daughter's, I don't know, I have to tell the story. That was a couple years ago. I had inch and a quarter thick T-bones, baby. Oh, and I, I learned over years to finally do steak well. You bring it up to room temperature. You don't cook it when it's cold. You let it out for a half hour or an hour or whatever it takes. You give you fire really hot. And you fire. And, and I typically, if it's a thick steak, I'll do seven minutes and five. If it's thinner, I'll do five and three. Because I like it pretty juicy. Really juicy, actually. And so I, we cooked the steaks one time. And I said, I'm going to make them juicy. And the, the girls were like, oh, no, Dad, that's gross, blood running, blah, blah. I said, well, if you don't like it, I'll put it back on and do it more well for you. But I cooked them the way I like them. And I was sitting in my garage, and silence happened outside. They were out by the picnic table. I'm like, uh-huh. They know what's up. This is good. And one of my daughters, who were remain nameless, comes in the garage like a caveman with this T-bone steak in her 
and blood and juice is running down her chin. I want to show her it's running clear down her arm, dripping off her elbow. Dad, this is delicious. I said, yeah, no. I told you. This is the way steak. I'm, I'm not. Listen, if you like your steak, well done. There's no judgment in here today. You can still be saved. That's my point. Is it? But Paul's talking about something here. He says, listen. God is so intimately personal with each one of us that he's going to deal with us each differently. Do you know that? My convictions don't have to be your convictions. If the Lord convicts me not to eat meat, there's probably a reason for it. If he convicts me to completely abstain from alcohol, there's probably a reason for it. If he convicts me to not go to a certain place, there's a reason for it. My conviction before God is the way he deals with me. Because he's personal and intimate. If I have a struggle or an issue or a problem with something, and God says, you need to stay away from that because you're not, you're not up to par, you can't deal with it, you can't handle it, then he's probably right. And then I need to abstain from that. Does that make sense? He, the, the Lord lives to make a, a personal, intimate relationship with you because he knows you probably even better than you do. I pray that he never tells me to abstain from staying. I like steak. I also like seafood. Bacon wrap scallops. And I get an amen. I don't know what a scallop is or where it lives or what it does or how it grows, but I'm just glad it does. I just praise the Lord for scallops this morning. I made bacon wrap scallops the other night on my smoker grill. He made it good for a reason. He loves us. Colossians 2.16, if we can go there. The book of Colossians really deals with religion. The whole New Testament really deals with religion because that was the problem. What's religion? It's born without power. He says, Paul's writing this, he says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. We just go ahead and go to the next ones there. You have, did you get that memo? 220? Yep. Oh, look at that. So he goes on. He says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, that's a fancy term for the law. Okay, the elementary principles of the word rules. Why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to, to such degrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men. These are matters which have to be have to be sure of the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Now there's some things here that you want me to unpack. Because like what's self-abasement? Okay. This actually happened in the, in the New Testament. There was, there was basically cults who would abuse their bodies when they sinned. They, the self-abasement, they would cut themselves, they would beat themselves up as an atonement for their sin. It didn't work, obviously. It, was, it would be like you, like if you mess up real bad and you beat yourself in the head with a hammer because you're mad at yourself. Well, Paul's, what's the point? You're, you're saying, like, what kind of crazy people were there? Well, we still do that. It's in a different manner. But that's what they did. That's how they atoned for their sin. And so Paul's saying, listen, this whole idea, if you can go back to that scripture before there, this whole idea of you trying to come up with something, and, and, and he's talking about the commandments and teachings of men. We, we, the, the, at that time, they had made up, the, the religious people had made up so many stinking rules that didn't have anything to do with scripture. And he said, listen, this will not get you closer to the, to the Father. You can, you can follow all these rules and teachings of men, but it's not from God. Listen, there's all kinds of rules that, that we still make up in the religious circle. I'm not, I don't want to pick on any given uh, church. By, by nature, we are idol makers. And by nature, if I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop doing this, I'm not going to do this anymore, or I'm going to dress this way, or I'm going to get rid of a certain thing in my house, that's going to make me closer to God. And Paul's like, no. no. No, you don't get it. That's not how you go close to the Lord. 
If the Lord convicts me to throw my television set out, then I'm going to throw it out. But I can't find it on page 76 where he says, if you don't have TV, if you have TV in your house, you're not. You can't find it. And I don't want to get like step on toes. But Paul is. He's saying, guys, the Holy Spirit didn't tell you this? Where did you come up with it? This is the realm where the Lord, our closeness with the Lord brings about conviction. Right? That makes sense. I was convicted recently of something. There was a phrase we were using in our house, and I was like, the Lord specifically said, you need to stop that. And it's not, it's a heart issue. I was like, okay. So I gathered the troops and I said, we're not going to do this anymore. It's not, that's not a big deal. But it was nice to have that settle in my heart. Like I knew the Lord spoke to me. I'm like, okay, well, there's a purpose for that. I don't necessarily need to know what it is, but there's going to be fruit for it. When the Lord speaks, He creates. That's His nature. And when He spoke that word into my spirit, I was like, okay, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to do something with it. But there's a little bit more here to the story. Can you go, let's see how we can do this. Can you go back to Colossians 2.16, please? You are a daisy if we did I like this. Because I read this yesterday. And I do, like, I will confess, there's some times where I have a judgmental spirit. That's all of us. We look at someone and say, oh, I don't think you should be doing that. Well, that's not really good. And I'm not talking about, like, a blatant sin issue. I'm talking about things that, like, oh, I don't know if I would do that. This or that. What's the point? Paul's like this. No one is to regard, is to judge you on how you handle the Sabbath. Or how you handle your food. Or how you, it's not, it's not my job to do that. And when I read this scripture, I'm all like, yeah, so get off my back, church lady. If I want to wash my car on Sunday afternoon, by God, I'm going to do that. So, yeah, you can just get out. By the same token, by that same reality, is this. Then if someone's convicted that they shouldn't work on a Sunday, that's between them and the Lord. It's not my business. It's not my right to say, oh, you, whoa, hey, you can't get that. No. The, Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You do what the Holy Spirit allows you to do. That's the relationship. The religion says to make up a bunch of rules. I personally was convicted that I don't do anything I don't want to do on Sundays. Maybe that's selfish. But anything I don't like, like I, don't, I hate paying bills. It's work to me. I don't pay bills on Sundays. Sometimes I think there's like three weeks of Sundays and then they send letters and say, yeah, we're coming, you know, but I can't, you know what I'm saying? I was convicted a long time ago. Like I was washing my car on a Sunday afternoon and I was like, I like doing this. I, I enjoy it. This is my, this is my happy place. I like it. It's fun. And the Lord's like, well, then why all you enjoy your Sabbath and go wash your car? Maybe wax it too. I don't know. Wax and that's a whole, that's a lot more work. But what's the point? This whole walk we're, we're in is so deeply intimate and personal that it's between you and the Lord. I have three daughters, four, three and a half, four daughters in my house. I treat them all differently in a manner of speaking because they're all different. I have a different relationship with each one of them, and it's okay. One of them, the two of them might think that they get special, or the other ones get special treatment. You never tell this. And maybe I do that and not realize that that's probably true. What's the point? But I have a relationship with each one of my kids. I know them pretty well because they never, they're always around. They're like, you know, straight cats and eat like everything. Eat everything. Amen. That's good. But the, the Father, as we think about Father's Day, He's the same. I want you guys to grip that this morning. That you don't, don't pressure yourself to follow, conform the rules of men, or this or that. If you want to put any pressure on yourself, pressure yourself to get alone with the Father and let Him speak to you. Jesus did it. I think there was times when He got sick of people. I think there was times when He got out of the boat and there was tons of people there and He's like... Are you kidding me? Do I have to preach again? I got to tell you guys all this stuff again. You know what? I need to go up on the mountain and be with Pop. My tank's empty. Like, I just need to get alone with Jesus. 
I submit to you this, that that is a, one of our highest forms of worship when it's just me and him. You guys have probably heard me say this a thousand times. I love it whenever I can get my daughter, when we go on a date, and it's just us. There's an intimacy that builds. There's relationship. There's no outside influence. It's just me and her, me and them. Same with your spouse. And it would be silly for me to try to maintain right relationship with the Father without just taking some time, just me and him. Sometimes we need copious amounts of time. Copious is not a West End word. I think copious means a lot for me. There's times when Jesus, he did it for 40 days before he started to minister. He just went out, fasted, and hung out with Bob because he needed to get his tank filled up. So what's the point? Get your tank filled up. I said this morning when we started out that Worship is a place of exchange. And in, in the time when we're intimate with the Father, that's when He speaks. And it can be during worship, it can be during your prayer time. But it, it, the, the Father wants to whisper a word to you into your spirit that will deeply impact you because He loves you and cares for you and He wants His best for you. I'll share a story, one of my convictions that happened one time. Um, I was in the basement. I'm just reading and praying. And actually in Romans 8, which I read some of this morning in chapter 8, verse 6, he says, when the, mindset of the, when the, the mindset of the flesh is death. Is death. And that's what Paul talked about with fleshly indulgence. He says, these things, these rules that these guys made up have no value against fleshly indulgence. What is fleshly indulgence? It's my, my desires. My fleshly indulgence is to eat 10 steaks. Well, that's gluttony, so I'm not supposed to do that. My fleshly indulgence is to look at the jogger going down the street in spandex. That's my fleshly indulgence. But following rules will never get me away from those things. It won't. It just doesn't work. It's self. It's, it's, it's all about me and following rules, and it won't help me. I need the Holy Spirit of God to get me back on track. That's His job. And when I let Him in my house and He does His job, good things happen. So I'll share the story. You're all in the edge of your seat. You just can't wait to hear the story. Set in my basement, reading Romans 8, never forget it. Romans 8, chapter 6, or, <laughs> chapter 8, verse 6. Mindset on the flesh is death. Mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Who wants life and peace? Well. <laughs> Almost good enough to fall off the stage. Who wants death and did, who wants death and no peace? Like anxiety. Oh yeah, sign me up. I really want to, that's the way I want to go. I want to be anxious and nervous and upset all the time and not have any life and just walk around gloomy, gloomy. How you doing? Oh, thanks for noticing me. The Eeyore spirit, you know, there shouldn't be any Christian Eeyores. I get it. We go through valleys sometimes. That's fine. Don't camp there. Get out. Don't set up a tent in the valley. The Eeyore spirit needs to leave the church. The, the Eeyore spirit needs to go. The church needs to be happy, fun. We say it all the time. If church isn't fun, like if it doesn't get, get you fired up to worship, to read, to pray, to be with believers, to go to the picnic and bring yummy food for me to eat next Sunday, <laughs> something's out of whack, man. We, this body should be the most attractive organism on the planet. It won't happen without his divine influence, without his spirit. Back to the story. You guys are really... Like, really, I can tell. He just, like, it's a story. So I'm sitting in my basement. And I was reading that scripture. I, is this like the third or fourth time? I'm a mess, sorry. I'm just, it's Father's Day. I can do what I want, you already said. So the, reading this scripture, and a knock came on the door. And I'm like, my hat was my redneck thing that had to leave me, man. I had a bad redneck attitude, dude. Like, it stank. I'm an NRA, NRA gun toting me, and don't mess with me, I'm busted. You know, I had that spirit going on in there, and to a large degree, it had to go, and it went. And I was, it's a free thing. The knock came on the door, and the first thing that I thought is, if that's a, if that's a robber or a ne'er do well or whatever, I'm going to go over to my gun safe, get my AR 15 out, and chop that guy in half with it. Because I can. I got a 30, 40 round clip. I'll pop that thing in there and pop, 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 pop. I'll just mow him down. You don't come near my house. Don't mess with my kids. It was so bad that one time my wife was in the flower bed out front and I watched a car go by three times. And they were looking. And they didn't know I was home. And my hat was out. My blood was boiling. I know. I get it. I'm a man. I know what they're doing. They didn't know I was home. I found out this is an effective way to get rid of that. 
stand in your driveway with an AR-15 with a clip in it like this the next time they drive by. It fixed it. They didn't drive by no more. This had, this had a problem. As a Christian, as a man, I need to be praying for those guys in that car. Not me. My heart was jacked up. Maybe I should have just said, hey, I see you driving by my house a lot. I get it. It's a struggle. You want to look. I get it. I love you anyway. I know you want to look my way. I love you anyway. And so the knock came on the door that day, and I'm all, you know, and the Lord said, What are you thinking? What are you thinking, Dan? He said, Your mindset on the flesh. You have a mindset on the flesh. It's all about you. It's, it's all about you. I'm not saying don't protect your family. That's not what I'm saying. That's not the issue. The issue is the heart. What I do is a reflection of where my heart is. And I hit the floor, man. And I was like, God, I'm a, I'm a mess. That There's not an ounce of love in that right there. It's not. It's not loving at all. And so what's the point? It was his spirit and working with the scripture that was like, Dan, you're a ding -dong. I was like, yeah, you're right. And then, this, then he started telling me, this, this is a number one of all wax. Then he's like, you sell your guns to get out of debt. And I was that redneck, I would never sell a gun, man. I never not in a chip. No way, no how. I ain't selling my gun. You kick me out of my lifetime, man. I already remember I'm a gun tote beating to people. Why don't I drive a pickup truck? I ain't selling money. You nuts. The Lord said, sell your guns. And you know what happened? I sold some guns. And it wasn't hard. I had such a peace with it. I sold my AR-15. It's gone. I don't have it anymore because I sold it. A guy gave me money and he took it away from me. And then I sold uh, Remington Well 742, which is a, it's a semi-automatic 30 on 6. So, you know, it was really cool. I really liked it. I got a good deal on it from a really good friend. You can sell it. But I had the most incredible thing. When I sold those guns, this happened. I, I didn't have an ounce of, of worry. But I don't need guns. I just need him. That's it. And actually, the second gun I sold, I, I wanted to sell it for the same price that I bought it for. And I knew it was worth more than that. I knew I could have probably gouged somebody in order to sell for this amount. I sold it for that amount. I gave it to the guy, and it was a couple weeks later until he paid me because I trust him. No. And I opened up the envelope, and guess what happened? Anybody guess? He gave me more. Yeah, he doubled it. He doubled that amount. The Lord loves to produce increase out of obedience to his spirit. The, the idea of religion, I, I can take this book and make a whole bunch of rules of it. I'm not saying this is at all a sin license. Hear my heart. But this thing is so intimately personal that he wants relationship with you with every single thing you do in your life. Every decision. When you bend over and tie your shoes, you have permission to say, Lord, help me get back up. When you walk out the door, you have permission to say, Lord, give me eyes to hear and and. and, and Wait, you hear with your ears. I, you know what I'm saying. Lord, I want every step to be directed by your spirit. You have permission to do that. That's, that's the intimate relationship. He says, those who are led by the spirit, these are the sons of God. Honey, that's where your freedom is, baby. It ain't in a pile of rules. Rules is bondage. I'm not saying that there's not things that we need to do to obey. That's obvious. There's direct commands in scripture. But whenever I make it more about that than relying on him, I have, I have jumped outside the realm of relationship and built myself a little religion. Do you know why Judas killed himself? Killed himself? This is my scriptural opinion. He couldn't handle the guilt. He couldn't handle the shame because he betrayed Jesus. He sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. What did they do? Come and crucify him. And Judas is like, oh crap, man. I have guilt, shame. i got to deal with it. You know what he did? He went out and hung himself. It's the ultimate form of self-abasement. Guess what? It didn't do him any good. It just didn't, it didn't help them get closer to the Father. So I want to encourage you guys with that this morning. If there's, if there's something in your life that you're like, man, I just don't know what to do. I don't. 
Number one, say, Lord, I don't know what to do, and that's okay. God is not upset with you when you don't know what to do. He is really attracted by when you say, Lord, I want to know what to do. And it would be silly for me to say here today to this group or the people watching online that there's not something that we're wrestling with. There's not an area of, Lord, I'm not sure what to do here. But I want to encourage you with this. He is very near to that place. He knows what's best for you. I mean, he is God and kind of knows everything. And there's a, there's a beautiful spot of freedom and rest when we, when we do what? We be still and know that he is God. Amen. Here's another, another one, another truth that's real. The Lord, when you're seeking him, and if you get one wrong, like if you do something that wasn't exactly what he wanted you to do, you have permission to make mistakes. I'm not saying go sin. But you have permission to be like, okay, Lord, I thought you wanted me to go this way. I went this way, but now I see I should have went this way. God's like, that's all right. I, you had to go this way because you didn't see me over here. But now you do, and it's cool, and we're, and we're getting this thing on. I'm not mad at you. It wasn't a sin. It's not a sin to make mistakes. The end of Romans 14. I don't know that I have it. Uh, it it's the last verse. Kind of simplifies things a little bit. Romans is right after Acts. Okay. Are you, are you going to put it out? Paul says this He who doubts is condemned if he eats. And he's just, that's just, again, he's using that as an example. He who doubts if he eats, because eating is not from faith. This eating is not from faith. And whatever, whatever is not from faith is sin. That last phrase there kind of got me. Whatever is not from faith is sin. What's that mean? Whatever I'm doing that's not what out of what I believe about God and what he wants for me and what he doesn't want for me, whatever I'm doing outside of that realm is actually sin. If God says go to Nineveh and you don't go to Nineveh, it's sin. And if you don't do that, you might get swallowed up by a big fish and I'll write a story about you in the Bible. What's the point? When the Lord speaks and I choose not to act, that's disobedience and sin. He doesn't usually bless sin very well. So I want to encourage you guys this morning. So it's really a lot, probably a lot to digest this morning, but just to make it simple, you have permission to go to him with anything. Anything, anything, anything. Sometimes the enemy will whisper in your ear and be like, that's trivial, that's stupid. Why do you need to pray about that? Just do this. No. No, I want to involve my pop. I want to involve my father in it. I love it when my kids do that. And sometimes I see them when they don't. It doesn't a lot of times go well. But I love it when they do. They're like, Dad, I, I need, what's, hey, Dad, hey, what's up? What's up with this? I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I can help you here because I, I, I have some wisdom and I went through that. So let's do this. It's attractive. And it produces increase. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your desire to be intimate with me, even when I'm a bingo. Um, I thank you for your direction, Holy Spirit, your conviction, that you do your job. Lord, I pray this blessing over these people in here this morning, that, that we would be hearers of your voice and doers of your will. I pray against distractions from the wicked one that cause us to not hear rightly from you, God. I just pray... That we would hear clear, that we would that we would see clear, that we would boldly go out of here in love and not fear. And the shame and guilt you have in place here, like the blood of Jesus over these people. We thank you for that reality. God, I pray your words would just echo in our hearts as we go this week. I pray that you would speak, Holy Spirit, so loud that we would not have a chance to not hear you whether it's for people, whether it's just your voice in our ears or your word, Lord. Um, we just pray that we would hear you well. And ask your blessing on our ears. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, this is dismissal. Not going to flash you today. Um, the offering bucket is over here. We give um, 
ask your blessing, ask God's blessing, ask him to multiply it, use it well. If he tells you to sell a gun and he doubles your money, it's because he's good, it's because he loves you. So don't forget, next week, Robin Amanda's sign up sheet out there. The following week, don't come here. It will be locked, there will be nobody here. Enjoy your weekend, take a break. Love you guys, have a great week.